Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of some of my recent reading in order of least depressing to most depressing. I picked up an advanced copy of a children's book, and I discovered it because it was on Archipelago Press's NetGalley site, and I had never seen a children's book from Archipelago. They specialize in doing translated fiction, much of which is super either artsy or depressing or political or all three. So a children's book with a pun title just intrigued me, and it's been released since then, and it is not actually under the Archipelago imprint, so that was kind of disappointing because I was excited thinking, wow, they're putting out a funny kids book under this press subname? But no, <laughs> they aren't actually. In any case, this was a Claude Ponty book, Blaze and the Castle Cake for Bertha Day. Claude Ponty is both the writer and artist on this, and his art is just fantastic. The amount of tiny details into each page, because this is a book where you have text on one side and then a full page piece of art on the other, and just all of the tiny details, both illustrating the story but also sort of jokes, winks to the camera. Yeah, just the intricacy of everything is amazing. So this is a book that is 100% worth it just for the illustrations, because it is the kind of book that if you were reading this with a young child, you could spend five times as much time on the pictures as you would on the text because there's just so much detail and so much to take apart and so many winks to the, both the child audience and the adult audience. Just fantastic stuff. Now the other thing that Ponty is known for is he writes a lot of puns and, and gags into the names, which is very common in a lot of French children's books. The problem here is that the translation tries to do the same thing, and the problem with that is that the names just aren't they don't always work, and so you have a lot of things that are slightly awkward because they're trying to keep both the meaning of the story and the puns, where the puns and the jokes go, and it just doesn't quite work. So the text is a little bit awkward. I think the name is a great example of that because Bertha is just not as ordinary of a name as Anne is because it's a play on Bertha Day is obviously birthday, and in the French one she was Anne, anniversaire, right? And just because Bertha is such a less common name than Anne, it just sounds more awkward and obvious in the English, whereas in the French I think it, it just it rings differently. So I think this the text in this suffers slightly from trying to keep the wordplay and the story, because it just doesn't quite work. But again, this is the kind of book that I think you are picking up for the art, so it almost doesn't matter that it's awkward, but it was kind of awkward. So. Uh, but still, 100% recommended just for the art because it is fun in almost a Where's Waldo kind of way, even without the story. So that was, it's, it's great. Next up, I read another advanced copy, and this is one that I took forever to finish because it ended up not being what I thought it was going to be when I requested it. And this was Alexandra Rowland's A Taste of Gold and Iron. Now, this is published by Tor, which is normally a publisher that does SFF. So I was expecting a fantasy novel with, based on the cover, a romantic subplot, but it's actually the reverse. This is a genre romance with fantasy trappings. And so I was reading this expecting more of a political fantasy, and it just isn't. It's a slow burn romance, which means it is much slower moving than I expected. So when I was finding this really tedious early on, uh, eventually I had to work out, oh, this is not sitting in the genre that I expected it to be. And I'm not particularly a fan of that sub type of romance at all, so I don't know that I would have picked it up had I known that's what it was, except that I'm always drawn to any kind of fantasy that is not pseudo-England or pseudo-Japan in terms of setting, because I feel like 90% of the ones that we see in English are that. So that this has a pseudo-Ottoman setting I was excited for, and somewhat disappointed that it turned out to not be centrally a fantasy or a political fantasy, but was instead centrally a romance. The issue that I had with the setting, even though that was what made me choose it is that I don't think the author really thought through everything. So there's a character in here who is a pseudo-Greek character, right? And he's such a stereotype that at first I thought, well, okay, maybe the author is going to subvert this. And they don't do that. And I kind of think that the author didn't know that that's what they were doing. I went and looked at the author's web page and they're, they go into saying they were watching The Magnificent Century and that's how they came up with this setting. And I think they were watching that and not clocking, like, they don't say that they're of any kind of Eastern Mediterranean heritage themselves, so I think they watched that and didn't get 
the stereotypes that they were watching and just put that in the book without knowing that that's what they were doing. Because in general, what they've done in this setting is made a lot of sex and gender and sexuality related stuff far more neutral than it would be in like the magnificent century, right? And to put all of that in line with kind of modern or progressive sensibilities is great, but when you leave the xenophobia in there, it's a little jarring. And I think they didn't realize that that's what they were doing. Uh, similarly, there's some language stuff where I think they didn't think through uh, the implications because there's a character who uses neo-pronouns and they're written in a way that implies that they are the in-world language, but the in-world language is strongly suggested to be the equivalent of, if not modern Turkish, at least Ottoman Turkish, which again is a gen which is a gender neutral language. So if you're having this extra set of pronouns, that would presumably be the translation into English in the same way that he and she would be, right? So again, I don't think that was thought through, but this is like, it's a fantasy romance. I am over <laughs> analyzing this, probably because I was hoping it was gonna be a political fantasy, which it isn't. So I think somebody who's looking for this kind of slow burn male male romance in a fantastical setting with some politics on the side, but centrally a romance, here you go. I didn't really like the characters, so as a romance it didn't work for me, but that is so taste-based that I'm sure this will be for other people, even though it was disappointing to me. Next up I read a couple of collections of short stories. First up, Rumina Bujerovska's My Husband. This was translated from the Macedonian by Paul Filov, and each story in this is centered around a woman who is talking, at least in part, about something concerning a husband. Sometimes it is in relation to their actual relationship, which is usually not a good one. Sometimes it's in relation to how their husband has an impact on their relationships with their mother or their child, or how they deal with tragedy, or if they're having an affair, why they are, if he's having an affair, why he is. So, and it's kind of fantastic because a lot of the stories feel like gossip. So it's very compelling. It's one of these things that you can read really quickly. But at the same time, there's a lot of stealth commentary in the background about things like class, about things like nationality and ethnicity, because there are bits where one of the stories, for example, is by um, a diplomat's wife and how she's kind of wielding her power in having an affair, in having affairs, and how that ref reflects on her husband. There's another one where the husband has uh, raised the child to use some ethnic slurs, and what does that mean in relation to things that they find out when it comes in terms of family secrets and things like that. But at the forefront is always kind of this gossipiness, and I thought that was kind of fantastic, because I think there are a lot of stories that try to do the reverse. So they're innately kind of gossipy, but they're, the presentation is, this is something serious. And so I was kind of charmed by the fact that this was, here's some gossip, but no, there's commentary here too. So I thought this was a fantastic surprise because I was expecting it to go the other way. And uh, yeah, I thought this worked really well, but I do think it'll be disappointing for anyone who's going in expecting the seriousness to be forefront instead of the background, but I think it worked better that way than it would have the other way. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Next up, I read an older collection of short stories. This is Yusuf Idris's The Cheapest Nights. This is a collection of short stories that were published between the 1950s and the 1970s and were translated, a chunk of them in the 50s and then a chunk of them in the 80s, by Walida Wasef. And this is almost the flip side, a perfect pairing with my husband because the difference here is that all of these stories are centered around men and their views of their lives. Most of the stories in here are quite short and primarily deal with kind of the trouble that men living in mid 20th century Egypt in poverty are getting themselves into. So there is, for example, a man who drinks too much tea at night and ends up wandering through the street and gets himself into things. There's another one that a man who was rich and he was trying to block off his grounds and how that doesn't work out. There's one where a man is chronically unemployed, so he's selling his blood and what his wife thinks of that. and somebody's dealing with impotence and is he going to ruin his wife's life because of his own impotence, things like that. And this was one in which a lot of the characters are frustrating to read about, but there's something kind of entertaining about that. The one odd thing that I found about this is that some of the romanizations that are used of certain Arabic words are odd, like they're words that you would recognize if they were spelt differently, but they're spelt in 
a really strange, but they're, it, it's like the, the translator chose a romanization at random. <laughs> and so I was frequently looking at a word and going, what on earth is that supposed to be? And there are footnotes in the back, but, and often it was something really obvious, but it, it's like, why are you spelling that with a G instead of a J? So that was a little strange. But other than that, I think this is a really interesting time capsule of, as I said, mid 20th century Egyptian poverty and whatnot. In the introduction to this, there is a note that there is something that is lost in translation in this, in that this author was famous for writing his stories in which the narration is in modern standard Arabic, but the dialogue is in colloquial Egyptian Arabic. And there is no way to convey that in English. So that's something that we miss out on. That author was at the forefront of using that as a device in writing. So that's something that's interesting to know about, but you don't get it when you read this in English. So. And finally, I read Mahmoud Darvish's Journal of Ordinary Grief. This was translated by Ibrahim Mughawi, uh, who is yet another translator. Every book I've read of Darvish's has been by, translated by a different writer slash translator, so that's interesting. This book was originally published in, 19, in the 1970s, and so it's interesting reading this because all of the past work that I've read from him is much from much later in his life. He passed away in, um, in 2008. Everything else that I've read from him was written in the last 10 years of his life. So reading this, I guess you would almost call it poetic essays about um, life in semi-exile as a Palestinian in the 1970s. And it's fascinating because it has so much more bite to it than his later work. His later work has a kind of sad resignation to it, whereas the this book from the 1970s still has, is almost, I would say, active in a way that's hopeful. Like it feels more negative, but it's negative because there is more hopefulness, whereas the later work is kind of resigned to, well, nothing is getting better. <laughs> the parents are not getting their farm back because they are long dead in, later in his life, obviously, but also because politics of settlement and everything. So it's fascinating just aside from the book itself to compare to his later work and how much the tone has shifted even though it is ve dealing with very similar work because I've seen a number of people say that essentially this uh, In the Presence of Absence which is just brilliant it was one of my favorite books that I read a couple of years ago when I first read that that there are essentially a trio of books that Darvish wrote is that are essentially memoir-esque poetry, that's essentially memoir slash poetry. And In the Presence of Absence was the last of them. There was another one in the middle that I'm not remembering. And then this was the first one. And it's really interesting not having read the middle one, but just the first and last, really fascinating. And it's kind of fascinating because even in this, he's kind of reflect, he is re still reflecting on earlier points in his life because he was born in the forties. So he wasn't, uh, so he was middle-aged when he wrote this, and uh, the work that I'm talking about having read before was written when he, written when he was elderly, but it's kind of, fa it's fascinating because this is still looking back in a similar way, but there is just so much more that implicit hopefulness, but anger that has hope implicit to it, if you know what I mean. Here's one part. Sometimes you used to ask, what is the relation between the conquerors and these stones, this water and these trees? You did not remember till later that their political and emotional discourse is attached to these in an astonishing manner, touching on details and things you cannot see. This is not your fault, because from your youth they restricted where you could live, and their writings became the only tool available to you for learning about your homeland. Is it not a strange paradox? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Later you remember that one aspect of your resistance is the emotional competition over the love of this land and not merely over mental claims to it. They have married the claim to sentiment. How can the conqueror be in love to such an extent? The French and the Americans did not write love poems for the forests of Vietnam. They died there, but without love. You dread the thought and fear that drawing such an example might be used as evidence against you. But Algeria saves you, so you calm down and feel assured about the efficacy of waiting. I don't know, it's, so it's very different in tone too. Uh, his later work, which, yeah, just really fascinating stuff. I think it's good on its own too. I feel like I'm talking about that saying you have to have read other things to enjoy that, which I don't mean, but having read them, it, having read his work in the reverse order essentially does make it an interesting journey at an external level in addition to the book itself.
Okay, I guess that's it for now. Uh, if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. Yeah, if you've read autobiographical works from an author at different points in their life, but in reverse order, I'd love to hear about that experience and what you read and who they were and how they changed, etc. Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.